Okay, let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics and maximizing the entropy by maximizing the W. So as you know from thermodynamics, uh, second law states that uh, for any spontaneous change, well really for any change, the entropy of the universe has to increase. So where does that come from? And ultimately it comes from quantum mechanics through statistical mechanics using just ideas from probability. So let's start small. Let's say we have three oscillators, so you can think of them as maybe three modes in a molecule or three diatomic molecules. But let's say we also have three total quanta of excitement. So what do I mean by that? So we know that the eigenvalues are E equals H nu times N plus a half. Um, so the total energy, the ground state would be three halves of an H nu um, from three oscillators. And then excitement uh, is H nu uh, for our excitement because we know that the spacing between the energy levels is an H nu. Uh, so we have some possibilities. We could have all three of the oscillators in the n equals one state, and that would be one plus one plus one would be three uh, quanta of excitement. Or we could have one in the one and one in the two, one plus two equals three. Or we could just have one in the three and two down in the zero. But these aren't all equally probable. So, in fact, there's only one way to put all three of them in n equals 1. And that's kind of just obvious, but also you can think of it in terms of probability. Um, for placing the first one in n equals 1, we can choose uh, between the three molecules, and then we have two choices for the second spot, and then one choice for the third spot. So that's three factorial, three ways times two ways times one way. But then since these particles, we assume that they're indistinguishable, so then we have to divide by 3 factorial. Um, and really, what this amounts to is it's the number of particles and then divided by the occupancy of each of the states. So 3 factorial divided by 0 factorial, which is 1, times 3 factorial times 0 factorial times 0 factorial, etc. So for this state, it's going to be 3 factorial divided by... 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, so that's 6. For this state, it's 3 factorial divided by 2 factorial, 0 factorial, 0 factorial, 1 factorial, so that's 3. So the probability then of being in, let's say, this state, 0, 1, 2, is going to be the number of waves. You can be in 0, 1, 2, which is 6, divided by the total of all possibilities, which is 1, plus 6 plus 3, so there's 10 possible arrangements. So 6 divided by 10, 60%. So there's a 60% probability that you'll be here. Okay, so this has the largest W, so this has the largest entropy, um, just to make another connection to entropy. And we'll, we'll go back there again and again. Okay, uh, another example. What, what if we had four quanta of excitement with four oscillators? And we wanted to know what's the probability of being in 0, 1, 1, 2. So in other words, one particle in the ground state, two in the first excited state, and one in the second excited state. Well, if you look at all the possibilities, you could have all four of them in the first excited. You could have 0, 0, 0, 4. You could have 0, 0, 2, 2. You could have 0, 0, 1, 3, or 0, 1, 1, 2. That's the one that we're interested in. You go through and calculate the W's. They all have 4 factorial in the numerator. And then this one has 4 factorial in the denominator because all four of them are in the same. And etc. You get the idea. You do those calculations. You got one way you can do this, four ways you can do that, six ways you can do that, 12 ways you can do that, 12 ways you can do that. So these two distributions are equally likely. And if you add them all together, 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 24, that's 35. So 12 out of 35, there's a 34% probability. And so on. So those are just some examples, but it can be shown that as we get to n approaching infinity or maybe approaching a huge number like Avogadro's number, the dominant distribution becomes more and more likely and approaches an infinitely sharp peak, and that 
dominant distribution, it can be shown that, is the Boltzmann distribution. So it depends on the energy of the state and then divided by kT. And we've seen this before, so the probability of being in state I is e to the negative Vi over kT over the sum of all the possibilities. That's if there's no degeneracies. The denominator is Q. Or if there are degeneracies, then we have to throw those in there, so the GI. Um, also note, uh, you're, in your textbook, they use beta a lot. Beta is just 1 over KT or KBT, uh, where K is a, or KB is the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so if we know that that's the distribution for a large number, then let's take a look at a system with... Uh, let's take a look at the effect of degeneracy. So we could have a system where there's just n equals 0 and n equals 1. Or we could have a system where there's n equals 0 and then there's two states for n equals 1. And they're degenerate. And just for convenience, let's say the ground state, uh, the energy is 0. And the first excited state, the energy is kT. Just because that makes the math work out easily. And obviously you could scale this and, and it would all work out. Alright, but anyway. What's the probability of occupying the first excited state for a particle? According to the Boltzmann distribution, uh, P for system 1, and the first excited state would be E to the negative, so this energy is KT divided by KT, divided by the sum over the states, so you've got just two states here, 0 and KT. So that's 1 over E divided by 1 plus 1 over E. That's 0.27, so 27% probability of being in the excited state. If you're in system 2, then you've got to put those GIs in there as appropriate. So the excited state has a degeneracy of 2, so you got a 2 there, and then 1 plus 2, and you end up with 0.42. So in general, an increase in degeneracy in the state increases the probability of that state, and... Maybe that's intuitive, right? Um, if you have a whole bunch of degenerate states, it's more likely that a particle is going to end up in them. All right. Um, because of the importance of Q and how it connects to thermodynamics, we should talk just a little bit about calculating Q itself. So again, that's always going to be the denominator. It's kind of like your normalization constant, sum over all the states. So... Here we have a system A, B, C, and D, and we want to figure out which one will have the largest Q. So A has degeneracy in the ground state and the first excited state. So the Q is just the sum of all the states. So here are the two ground states. Here's the two first excited states, 2.74. C, we don't have any degeneracy. We've got this one, and then we've got a half, and then one, and then uh, three halves. Add those up, and it's 2.18, and so on. I'll let you think about how you would calculate B or D. But you can see that Q is larger for A than it is for C. All right, then that's talk about calculating Q if we have an infinite number of eigenvalues. So uh, it's often the case that, like, for example, we'll have the harmonic oscillator. It has these eigenvalues, but n can go from 0 up to infinity. Um, this 1 half makes the math awkward. Um, we can offset it, and if we do that consistently for Q and Pn, we'll end up getting the correct expressions for the probabilities of being in state n. And the math is a little bit messier here than you might expect. Um, so you'll just have to trust me on that one. Or um, if you're curious, I can find a, a PDF to send to you. Anyway, let's say we want to look at then the Q of being in state V. No, no, vibrational Q, sorry, vibrational Q. So summing over N, E to the N over KT, uh, we don't have the half in there, and this will just be an infinite series then, e to the 0, e to the negative h nu over kt, e to the 2, blah, blah, blah. And for this series, this is the same thing as 1 over 1 minus e to the negative x. So this is what vibrational QV is. 
And for a molecule, you're going to have this for each mode. Each mode can be excited, you know, with its own um, uh, frequency. And so you would sum over all of the modes. And you could figure out then the probability of being in each mode. Um, let's talk about uh, calculating um, the occupation for a specific molecule. So let's say that we had a mole of these hydrogen chloride molecules, and we wanted to know how many would be in each state at room temperature. And so at room temperature, here's the KT. Um, we also know the fundamental frequency, and we can convert it into joules. So we can easily get the Q, and then we can get the P0, and you end up with all but 5 out of 10 million. In fact, I think we did this, um, if you look back in your notes, I think we did this example towards the end of talking about the harmonic oscillator. First excited state is 5 out of 10 million, so there you've got basically all of them you would think, but if you go e to the negative 2 e over kt, then you got 3 times 10 to the minus 13. P3, you've got 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which is still 98,000 molecules out of a mole. And then P4, you're finally down below. No, you're, you're just above one molecule per mole. Right? No, no, sorry. You're, you're below uh, one in a thousand molecules per mole there. All right, that's it for today. So, and that should also prep you for being able to do the next problem set. So go ahead and get started on that. Make your attempt by Friday, and then it will be due the following Monday.